I was the only one that got out of it. So they're all very good at piano. I'm still learning. My older brother's a piano teacher. So he actually, he actually gives me lessons. Oh, and really? Yeah. Yeah. You were like the fucking Brady Bunch, man. <laughs> So this podcast is all about you and your journey in music and how you got to where you are now. We'll talk about the new record you have uh, coming out in a few, a week or so. Yeah, two weeks off, exactly. Um, <laughs> yeah, is my sound quality and everything okay? Yeah. yeah, 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 you sound great. Perfect. Cool, cool. Making sure uh, you look like you have such a professional setup. So. Oh, thank you. <laughs> I appreciate that. Um, I did read uh, you're from you're from uh, from Dublin. Is that right? Correct. OK, born and raised there. Yeah, born and raised there. Yeah, I lived there all my life. What's that like? Uh, I often describe Dublin as like being in a bad relationship. You know what I mean, it's like, <laughs> uh, it's like you really love that person, but they treat you bad all the time. <laughs> Why is that? You know, there's just like a lot of issues there, especially as like a young creative in terms of like the housing crisis that we have at the minute and the rental crisis and just even the erasure of cultural space and clubs and nightclubs and that sort of thing. The city, because of the current government, I suppose is kind of like kind of becoming very much a tourist destination. Oh, so sure. A lot of people are being priced out, like myself included. It's it's very like it it would be very common in Dublin if you're in your thirties even up to forties with a well paid job that you still live with your parents so that's kind really of, yeah yeah wow so the the housing market is just like that expensive housing market and the renting market like Dublin is uh, one of the most expensive cities to live in Europe it's more expensive to live there than Milan I believe and if you've ever really? been to Dublin compared to Milan. Dublin does not look like Milan, my friend. <laughs> wow. Do you know why that is? Just because the they made it a tourist destination? Uh, neoliberal kind of politics, I suppose, and um, yeah. incentivizing low tax rates for big corporate companies and, and kind of just like very short-sighted uh, development plans and stuff, you know? Wow. I yeah. didn't even realize that. That's, ugh, that's, that's unfortunate. Yeah, it's it's this it's a strange place. So it's very much, and I think a lot of people would feel that from living in Dublin. It's kind of a love hate relationship, mm -hmm. <laughs> a toxic relationship, as you said. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, how did you get into music? My mom would have put me into music since like a very young age. So I think she read somewhere that um, boys tend to concentrate better if they're in music in a young age really yeah and uh tend to be able to like focus on tasks better and she had four boys so she was like put these kids into music <laughs> sure you know what i mean yeah your other siblings are they artists or musicians all musicians yeah wow yeah they work uh you know with their jobs like one's a chef one's a piano teacher one's you know, work in restaurant business and stuff. But uh, yeah, we're all, all in music. All like very, they're all like a lot better at music than I am, which is funny. They're, really? Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, they can all just kind of pick up anything. I was kind of like, just uh, I was a shit as a kid. So <laughs> I did the basics and then I kicked and screamed and got out of a lot of my, um, you know, early piano lessons and stuff. But I'm going back and learning it now. That's good. That's good. So did all uh, you and your brothers all take piano? Yeah, I was the only one that got out of it. So they're all very good at piano. I'm still learning. My older brother's a piano teacher. So he actually, he actually gives me lessons. Oh, and, really? Yeah. Yeah. You were like the fucking Brady Bunch, man. <laughs> That's amazing. So do you, what do you go over his house and learn piano? Yeah. Yeah. Or we do it by Zoom now. Really? How often yeah. are you taking lessons from him? Uh, once a week, but really? uh, I'm in a week or two, so don't tell. <laughs> <laughs> That's crazy. That's amazing, though. Um, so are you the youngest of, of your four brothers? There's one below me and two above. Okay. Okay. And how did you get out of it then? I would assume that the youngest would be able to get out of the piano lessons. Um, I can't remember if he actually... 
No, I think he managed to get out of it too. I said a bad, a bad trend. Okay. <laughs> but yeah, I don't know. So I've just like I've played everything, you know. I started kind of like started with piano, and then I didn't really like that, but uh, got into drums after that, and I was really into that. Mm-hmm. And, and so I play a bit of everything. Okay, so drums is the next instrument. Yeah, and then just like from there, got a like cracked version of Ableton and started producing and that became like a lot more interesting because you could just you know sample stuff if you weren't good enough to play it or you could just you know you had all those synths and stuff so Mm -hmm. i got really into that and kind of really into production how how old are you when you got the cracked ableton i think i was 16 or 17 okay so i just would have taught myself how to use it from like youtube and stuff what about uh the rapping how how early on were you doing that It came about the same time because I was uh, starting off and I wasn't very good. So I didn't really want to ask anybody for beats. I was like, not good enough to be (laughs) asking people or showing. Oh, interesting. So I started producing myself and then, you know, just stick at it and you get better at it and stuff. So, yeah, I was fucking trash when I started. (laughs) Were you, uh, did you ever go out and perform to people or was it all kind of in in the bedroom thing? A lot of it was just to myself one or two friends on my show you know and it wasn't until I was probably about 20 I think that I actually ever played a gig kind of as um you know, hip-hop artist like so it was probably the first one when did you start Kojak was that or that where you are were you always going by that no that was like uh I I geez I started kind of writing rap and stuff when I was probably 16 or 17 mm-hmm have a name for it for a while because I didn't really I hadn't written anything that I thought was actually good enough to show anybody and then when I was kind of like 20 I'd say I started getting better and I was like you know what this is actually all right and I showed a couple friends and they were real encouraging they were like man you should really do this so I just came up with a name and then I think probably Midnight Flower was like the first song that I would have dropped that was like uh, you know full rap song with the name and the YouTube channel and the fucking avatar and everything so that was kind of like trying to launch the career if you know what i mean okay wow and and that was when you were about 20 or so yeah yeah okay um well prior to that like did you go to school for music i I think you went didn't you go for fine arts you're also an artist and film director you got a lot going on as far as artistic abilities yeah i went to college to do fine arts because i kind of just didn't see myself working a normal job basically and i like to draw so I was kind of like, yeah, I could do this. Mm-hmm. I really enjoyed it. I thought it was um, a really sick experience. I like a lot of times I was kind of like, I should just drop out and do music. Like, oh, really? Yeah. But um, I don't know. It kind of like I pushed through it anyway. And I'm very glad I did because I kind of got into filmmaking towards the end of my degree. Kind of made a degree show film. Um, at the end of it, and that just kind of like sparked my love for cinema again because I used to be into it when I was a kid. I used to make a lot of like YouTube videos, I had an old like YouTube account and everything, but I kind of just left it go once I got into like secondary school or I suppose mm-hmm. you call it like high school or whatever. But mm-hmm. yeah, just uh, got very, um, what would you say? I got a bit more embarrassed about it then, but I got, yeah, a lot more interested in it then after that. Okay. And I did, because I did see that you just, I mean, directed a, a recently a music video. And is that something that you were, were kind of pursuing always with, with music as well? Yeah. A lot of the artists that I really love, you know, I got into them through sick music videos, you know, and like, mm-hmm. I don't know, like Tyler the Creator and um, like a lot of Reggie Snow's early music videos I really liked. And it was just that thing where um, if I wanted to, like, I was independent for years and I was kind of, I didn't want to, what would you say? I didn't want the music videos to, to, to reflect that, you know, like to, I didn't want them to look like they had a small team working on them. I wanted them to be really big and kind of like ambitious and stuff. And so kind of like took that on out of necessity because I didn't have any money at the time and I didn't know anybody really that directed except for one of my friends, Sam McGrath, mm-hmm. and he was getting into videos at the same time. So, we kind of uh, worked together a lot and we've probably made about six or seven together. Wow. At this stage. And, uh, 
he really took to it. Like he was um, really interested in it, but he was only getting into it. I think Bubby's Cream was the f- first music video we did together. That was like, no budget. I was on the doll at the time, which is like, what would you call it? Yeah, money for nego- unemployment payment. Oh, okay. I had like just out of college on the doll, had absolutely no money. And so we just storyboarded this video out and shot it in like the Tesco car park, which is just a supermarket up from where I lived. Oh, really? Yeah, at night, like pitch black, you know what I mean? Because they left the lights on in the car park and I just thought it looked real sick. I was like, oh, that's cool. And they had this old little like public laundromat that you could go and like wash your clothes there and stuff. And so kind of based the whole music video around that. That was the first one that we did together. And then he's gone on to do amazing stuff. He's um, he's a real accomplished director now at the minute. So, wow. That's incredible. Um, well, after you released that first song, like what was there a moment that you like realized like, oh, this is actually really good enough to to put out? Like what do you remember like having that courage to release the the first song? Um <clears throat> I think I had recorded like one or two songs and my brother had helped me like record the vocals and stuff. And I showed them to a couple of people and there was one tune in particular that people were like, yeah, yeah, this one's, this one's really good. And uh, Midnight Flower kind of accompanied that. And I had this idea for a music video where I'd like, basically kind of like a performance piece where it was like, you know, if you could hold your breath underwater for the entire music video, no cuts. Um, I was like, that would be sick. And so I built, I built the tank in college it's like a Perspex, um, it's nearly like a fish tank, but like a Perspex box that I filled up with water, like in my bedroom. And just, oh my gosh, practice for a couple of weeks and try to help hold my breath and shit. And then, um, <laughs> how long do you have to hold your breath for? That must have been like a couple of minutes, like three and a half minutes, I think. Oh my gosh. Yeah. And then I passed out and, uh, we only did one take of it and I was like, yeah. That looks good. And so uploaded that. It was just intense. And then, um, yeah, that kind of took off. And I was like, cool, this is sick. But then it was still kind of like, I don't know, I was so early in making the music and stuff. I still wasn't actually that confident in it. And so it did take a couple of years of still recording and, and kind of producing and just finding my feet a bit more. <laughs> Well, I actually was like, yeah, you know what? This could be a career here, you know? Yeah, well, hold on. So three minutes underwater, like, how, were you a swimmer before, prior to this? Like, how did you even become able to, to hold your breath for that long? Like, how do you even practice that? Do you have somebody that knows CPR close to you or? You know, no, I, uh, I just looked up, you know, David Blaine. You know, he's got like the mm-hmm. world like, holding his breath. It's like 17 minutes or something. I was like, well, if this guy did it, And so he had this video where he kind of explained there's this technique called purging when you're, um, and anyone could do it. Basically you get the full capacity of your lungs and then you breathe out, you know, as hard as you can, you basically repeat that until your eyes go a bit fuzzy, you know? And the idea behind it is when you're holding your breath underwater, the reason why your chest starts to hurt is because when you inhale, air you're inhaling carbon dioxide as well as oxygen so Mm -hmm. if your lungs have a lot of carbon dioxide in them they'll you know your lungs don't like carbon dioxide so that's what makes them hurt but if you purge the air it basically rids your lungs of any residual carbon dioxide in them so you could do it now man in the bath and you'd probably hold your breath for a minute easy really yeah yeah i mean it's like you know disclaimer don't cry at home right right (laughs) Unless you have a lifeguard present. <laughs> well, uh, so that was kind of it. And then it was just the case of like over the course of like three weeks, just training a bit more and more to get the time up. But And were you just doing that like on land in the beginning? Like, okay, I'm going to try it. And then like, are you watching the clock? Like I can imagine watching the clock might be not a great idea if you're trying to hold your breath for a long period of time because you might get to like, a minute and be like okay like I'm, I'm, I'm struggling like i have two more to go yeah no, i was just doing it in the sink with the song playing in the background <laughs> oh my god get, get to it 
Yeah. That's fascinating. Oh my gosh. Yeah, so that was so, a that I kind of brought out. And then um it's been a long time since that one's coming. That's about five years ago or six years ago now. But really. still, I mean, to do that all like I mean, nowadays somebody would just be able to somewhat make it, you know, do it in, in, in post production, I would imagine, not hold your breath for three minutes, like actually do that, like go for it. Like, that's just so fascinating to me. Yeah, well, I was really into kind of performance art in college and um, like Chris Burden, for example, he's an, an American artist. I was really into his stuff and a lot of their kind of ethos is, you know, using your body as like as the art piece and endurance art where it's kind of you've got like an endurance piece where there's something, you know, it's either it's time sensitive or it's like sometimes it could be pain sensitive and um it was just something that kind of really captured me or whatever. So I guess that was kind of the mentality going into it, just all or nothing. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> and you really went for it. I mean, not only that, but you built this tank that you, that you did this video in. Yeah. I think it's in a shed somewhere in my <laughs> mom's house. That's crazy. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So, so from there you, got some success as far as like it went viral a little bit that video yeah it did uh i think a lot of people were probably more interested in the video than the actual music so that was also you know it's kind of like a double-edged sword because it's good to get uh, people's attention for stuff like that but um you want them to be there for the right reasons so i don't know i kind of just went back and kept writing and kept recording and then order released um a project in 2018 called daily daydreams and mm -hmm. um yeah that's just seemed to take off fairly well and allowed me to kind of tour around the place a lot and travel all over the world i've been south by southwest wow 19 which was sick it was kind of my first time properly being in america like as an adult and yeah it was a cool experience man and you get to perform as a, that's that's really cool so come over here to the states your first time as an adult and you're in your playing, that must've been huge. Yeah. I, I really enjoyed it. Um, and it was hot too. Jesus. <laughs> Texas uh, is mad. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I guess real hot in Texas. <laughs> and also just the, the layout of the city, how the, how the city is actually mapped out. I, it's it was so foreign to me this they only had like footpaths on one side of the road and stuff i thought that was so weird there's a there's a book um one of my lectures that put me on to i'll probably butcher the name but i think it's the life and death of the american city okay i haven't heard it, and it was i haven't read it yeah do you know um john ford invented the super suit uh, invented the shopping mall no i didn't know that really yeah and the idea behind it was uh obviously it, it was an incentive to sell cars so you would make a shopping mall that was just on the outskirts of the city that had everything that you could ever want as a person and the only way that you could get there is if you had a car oh the that's idea. fascinating oh my gosh so the, the guy's brilliant obviously so he creates the supermarket just far enough so you can walk and especially walk back with all your groceries. <laughs> so you're going to have to take one of his cars. Yeah. And it was also talking about kind of just like, yeah, the how um, I suppose American cities were, were built to kind of facilitate certain things. So I thought that was a really interesting thing when I was in Austin because we were in a little suburb in like an Airbnb or something. Mm-hmm. And uh, I remember we used to just walk, like we go, like there was a place, Dan's Burgers, we used to go to, and it was just on the highway, or we'd cycle into the convention center, which is where a lot of the stuff was on in Austin. And I remember just cycling around and we'd be the only people walking on the footpath, they're cycling about the place, you know? Mm -hmm. And um, I feel like that's probably a lot to do with the architecture of America, because it's, it's a lot easier to drive and it's built mm -hmm. up even just the, something as little as having footpaths on one side of the road and not the other. But yeah. Yeah. That's interesting. I'll have to look around my area about that now. Like why you'd only have, yeah. And now that you say that a lot of areas only have the sidewalk on one side and the mm -hmm. other side, there isn't one. <laughs> yeah. Um, wow. Okay. Yeah. Cause America's built a little bit different. There's like San Francisco and you have, 
like New York City, like there's a few cities that you could really get around, but even like a big city like LA, you have to drive. Oh yeah. I mean, you're not, it's not like the UK or, or, or you know, like a, a lot of European countries where you can just take public transportation everywhere. Yeah. Yeah, I guess it is a lot different. Huh? Yeah, wow. Well, so, okay, so you put out uh, that first record, 2018, which is a concept album, right? Yeah, yeah, it's the, it's about a week in the life of a deli worker. <laughs> what, how'd you come up with that idea? Um, well, I was working in, like, a shoe shop at the time when I just, like, work in retail, and it was um, one of my first, like, proper jobs that I was working, and I really liked it, like, but, you know, at the same time, it was kind of just, I really wanted to be doing music full time. Mm -hmm. um, and it's kind of where a lot of the songs came from, just working that retail job, feeling a bit hopeless about life and, you know, life as a musician and that being a prospect, just feeling like you're going to be stuck in one thing the whole time. And I think through writing the songs there, I'd mentioned the deli once or twice and I was kind of like, ah, oh, maybe I could link those together. So Delhi's a big part of Irish culture. Mm -hmm. And uh, so that's kind of where the loose concept came from. And then right. kind of linked it all together just with the interludes on the record. And that's that's kind of, yeah, that's where it came from. I mean, a lot of the different tracks are inspired by different things, but it's been a while since I listened to it. So, mm -hmm. Sure. And then that's the record that got you to South by Southwest. Yeah, and it's still, you know, to this day, it's usually when someone comes up and says that they like the music, it's usually because of that record, you know, um, which I'm real happy about because I recorded the whole thing in my wardrobe and in, in wow, I live. um, even down to like the saxophone that I had laid over a lot of the beats that's, you know, still all recorded in my bedroom. Really? Yeah, yeah. Wow. So that was totally like DIY self produced the whole record. Yeah, uh, it was the production was between myself and a, an artist from Cork called Jar Jar Jr. So he has about half the beats on the record and I have the other half. And then the whole thing I recorded and engineered. I even mixed it as well, actually, you know, I think about it. Um, really? All in my bedroom. Which is, it hasn't changed much. That's how I did my most recent album as well. Um, all in the bedroom. Really? The newest one or the one, in pro the one, bef the one that uh, came out in 2019, Green Diesel? That was in the bedroom too. Really? <laughs> one as well. Yeah. Okay. Well, tell me about that album. So you you get Delhi Delhi Daydreams blows up for you. You're you know coming to the states. You said you were doing some touring as well. Yeah, I had um, we did some tours in the UK. We played a lot of festivals around Europe. We did a tour with Slow Tie just in like December up there. Yeah. Yeah. So we'd been touring a lot and. Um, yeah, I think from like playing the festival circuit and stuff. <clears throat> Some of my buddies like King Avenue, who I set up the record label with, uh, he's a really good producer himself and he makes a lot of trap stuff. So he'd been making some trap tunes and um, me and Luca Pam, who was another artist on the label that I run back in Dublin, he's, um, he'd been like writing over them and the two of us were going back and forth. And so we kind of had a couple of these like, harder trappier songs and we were playing them with the live shows and it was crazy because the stages were getting bigger and especially with like festival circuit you get those big speakers and everything mm -hmm. just playing the harder stuff i was like shit this is fucking cool you know sure. and so we went about making green diesel which was only meant to take you know i, I was gonna do it in the interim and kind of like give that out to the fans so that I had a bit of time to kind of make the album, but it kind of took a little longer than I thought it was going to take. And I don't know, I guess I'm a bit of a perfectionist. And so, okay. I was going to ask why, why that was, but that, that makes sense. Yeah. It's just, you know, I wanted to get it right. And when you're collaborating with someone, you know, it's like, um, you got to get all your schedules lined up and everything. And I mean, mm -hmm. so it just takes longer than you always think it will. Sure. <laughs> And so that kind of, when was that out? 2019, I think September, mm -hmm. September, 2019. That so, was, fun. I really liked that because it was, uh, I found it quite freeing. But a collaborative project, I'm not kind of as worried about, I don't know. It was freeing in that sense because 
so much of the track already, you know, is taken up by Luca and stuff. And mm-hmm. just going into something that was a bit harder, like the beats were a lot harder than on Delhi Daydreams. And yeah, it, it was a, a real nice like project to work on. Mm-hmm. And well, that you said that came out in September 2019. Uh, and, you know, not much, not many months later, the whole world shuts down. Tell me about that. Like, were you planning like big things for, for Green Diesel that were kind of stopped? Like, where were you when the pandemic hit? Um, I was in London shooting a music video. So okay. I had been working on tracks for the album and I was kind of gearing up to... The new, the new album? Yeah, the new album. Oh, wow. So you put out Green Diesel in, in September and you were already on to the next? <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, I had tracks from the album that I had put aside from the last like four or five years, like tracks that I kind of, I had a concept in mind and stuff. And there was certain tracks that um, fit into that narrative. And so I kind of put them to one side. And so I was working on them and we were doing um, a music video in London for Schmelly, which would have been like the first single to come off um, the new album. And it was like March 2020 or 2019. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think it was, yeah, 2019, right? Has it been that long? <laughs> what year? Well, is March it? 2020, 2020 would have been, yeah, that's right before the pandemic. That would be when the pandemic like really smashed was like March. I know here in the States, I think it was March 11th or March 13th when the whole, when they shut down everything. Yeah. So and it must have been March 2020. Yeah, it was 2020. Yeah. And we were doing a music video um, and we, there was just like kind of like, you know, whispers of this coronavirus stuff. And mm-hmm. the other thing was the UK were, they came at coronavirus with a very different attitude than Ireland is. Really? Uh, yeah, because it was March 2020. And I remember my mom texting me and being like, yo, are you Okay like you know it's this virus is serious and stuff and i was like yeah everything seems to be fine like just to put it in perspective the day before i went home to ireland i went out to a karaoke bar this is like midway through march you know everyone's sharing one mic and everything oh man and and stuff and i went back the next day and my family treated me like i had radiation poisoning or something they were (laughs) like leprosy or something like you need to leave go into your room and do not come out until you know you're well and i was like what is going on i did like fully didn't realize how serious it was and uh then the next day the whole country went into lockdown see the uk didn't go into lockdown for another two or three months i think Um, wow yeah because well the states got went went into lockdown pretty quickly too i feel like yeah i mean i know the cases were really bad in in italy that's where it was really kind of hitting yeah. hard um I, I wasn't i didn't know about uh ireland shutting down that quickly ireland shut down very quickly and we um we did a really good job up until christmas and then we fucked it oh like, really royally fucked it it was just <laughs> were people just getting antsy and they were like you know i'm gonna go out anyway is that kind of what happened or it was just kind of like we got it to a point where we were nearly like zero new cases um and certainly we had no deaths in a couple of weeks and stuff and mm-hmm. it was coming up to christmas and the government just started to kind of ease restrictions and you could drink in pubs and of course it's christmas time so many people from london and the uk and stuff flew back home to see family at christmas sure and uh, unfortunately like a uk variant which was something like 40 percent more contagious than the previous one and so our cases went from something like, you know, like close to zero a day to like six or 12,000, I think. And Ireland's not big, you know. Uh-huh. And yeah, it was like an insane, insane increase. We went from like one of the best countries for coronavirus cases in Europe to the worst. Oh and my gosh, I didn't realize that. Yeah, so they, they like Ireland only opened up the pubs again there on Monday. So it's been in level five lockdown until from Christmas until last week, which is June. Really? Yeah. Um, I mean, in California, they're still kind of, I mean, I don't think they're even really opening everything until next week. 
I think I'm in Nashville now. I was I'm born and raised in California, uh, in Southern California, San Diego. And it, when we were, you know, there, it was like hardcore lockdown for a, the whole time up until, like I said, I think the 15th, they're opening stuff up a bit more, but like here in, in Tennessee, it's a, a lot more lax where we opened up last in May, May 15th. Hmm. So bars are open and, and everything's open now, but I didn't realize that you guys just opened up then on Monday. What was that like? Were people like going wild? <laughs> it was uh, there. There, it's still not full. You know, you can go to a pub uh, if it has an outdoor smoking area that you can sit in. So you still can't. Go oh, indoors. so you're still outdoors. Okay, so in California, it was open outdoors for a little bit, but I think they're opening up indoors on the 15th. So you guys are still not indoors yet. No. No, and it's mad, you know, when you see like countries like New Zealand where they're having festivals and stuff, and you're just like, Oh, I know, right? Okay, so I interviewed somebody from Perth, Australia, and this was like about three, four months ago, and they had like nearly no cases because they're way down here on the south end of the country, and everything else is kind of happening, you know, north east. Um, so I was talking to this guy and he was telling me they had been on lockdown for like a week or two. And he was like, and he's like, after this interview, I'm going to the pub and I'm going to get nine pints. Like it was like really amped for it. And I'm like, dude, you've been locked down for like two weeks. <laughs> hey, give me a break. We've everyone else in the world has been sh- stuck inside for like a year and a half. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah, I guess that to go back to your original question, I was coming back from London that we just we just shot a music video. Was um, that the video where you're in the green, like it's uh, you're in this huge green room? Uh, There's a sax group. player. And it's you and a sax right. player. Yeah, so that's um, I I went over in. So we shot the music video in March, and I don't think it came out until September. So March, April, May, June, July, August, September. Yeah, it's about four or five months. Basically, we wanted to release it with, um, that's from Colors Berlin is what you're referring to. Uh And it's this channel where you go and you do like a one take kind of live performance of a certain song. And we had it penciled in. It was meant to come with the release, but of course, everything got locked down. So oh. I wasn't able to travel to Berlin until June or July. Okay, so that was a different so video that went you were... Yeah, so that was like the live performance video, and then we did a music video for it as well that was released like the week after. Um, and yeah, in that space of time, basically the minute coronavirus hit, I was just like, well, I've got an album to record, so I'm just going to do it. And luckily for me, I've been recording my music in my bedroom since I was 18, 19. Mm-hmm. So I was more than happy to just sit around and record the vocals that I needed for the thing and do the production. And so basically just worked on the album throughout the whole pandemic. Oh, wow. So did you have, were the songs all kind of came together during the pandemic? I mean, obviously you recorded them, but were you writing throughout as well? Like all the songs of the new record, were they written prior or kind of half and half or? Um, the majority is prior. I don't think there's any that I that are on the album that I wrote during the pandemic. So I found it very difficult to um, to write anything. I've uh, just because of how mundane everything was and how repetitive the days were day to day and just not seeing people. I found it like an incredibly uninspiring time. But <laughs> luckily enough, I had a lot of material that I'd already written. I was mm-hmm. just kind of like waiting for some time to actually sit down and have a bit of free time to record it. So luckily enough for me, I was able to just record the whole album and produce the whole album in lockdown. So Wow. Wow. And it was all done by yourself? Um, there's a couple of different producers on the record. Uh, a guy from Belfast, Brienne. He's uh, an amazing artist, an amazing producer. So he's got a lot of production credit on the on the album. He helped me kind of put together a lot of it. And apart from that, there's The Count is on it, New Machines done some production, Matt Finnegan, um, Quez Darko. 
and then I, I'm on the production on the rest of it pretty much. Wow. And how are you able to collaborate with these artists? Was it all over like Zoom calls like this or? Well, it's, um, they just, I, they had beats. Oh, okay. <laughs> they just sent me beats and I was just like, yeah, I like this, you know, where they sent me a batch of beats and I just add some extra instrumentation over the top or record my vocal or record sax. And that's kind of how it worked pretty much. That's amazing. And then the record's coming out in two weeks. You must be super stoked about that. Yeah, I really am. Yeah. And uh, I can't wait, man. It feels like five, six years in the making. You know? <laughs> so many songs are so old. And like, even with the album, I, I would consider this to be my like debut album. I've obviously put out records before, but anything that I've kind of done previously, um, I would kind of consider them either to be kind of mixtapes or projects. So they're just, um, in terms of like, they're just like quite, not quite long enough and not quite fleshed out enough in my mind for it to be an album. I'm a big album guy, like big album lover. You know, if there's uh -huh. like, if someone puts an album out, I'm like very much, I'm not like a singles dude. I will, will listen to it like front to back in the track listing order and that sort of thing. I love so, that. I've just been obsessed with like the way albums are put together and like, um, you know, the artist's intention and stuff since I was probably about 15 or 16. Like, mm -hmm. so, yeah. So yeah. I would consider this like a debut album and I'm very proud of it. Like I'm real happy with how it's come out. So I love that. I, I feel the same way about records. Like there's something special about putting an album on, listening to it from front to back, because there's obviously a reason the artist chose the first song to be the first song, the last song, and, and there's got to, you know, there's a reason why each song is placed where they were. It wasn't like, oh, that was the first song I wrote, so that's going to be one, and then this is two. And, I mean, you obviously have to sit there and kind of curate the order of the songs. Is that... Yeah, yeah. Is that something that you were able to do? Like, how does that work for you? Like, I mean, you said this is your debut record. Was it like, okay, I have all these songs, now I got to figure out how the order is going to go. Or do you, as you're kind of putting it all together, you knew like, oh, okay, this is how the record's going to kick off. This is going to be the fifth song. It's going to be the eighth song. It was kind of difficult. Um, there were some songs that just made sense to be later in the album, depending on how they kind of service the narrative. If you know what I mean? Like there's some mm -hmm. songs that come be towards the start of the record because they set up the story. And then some songs that are kind of like finishers, like Curtains, the last song was always intended to be the last song on the record. Mm -hmm. um, but the ones in between, it's a difficult process because it was probably like the the album was like 16 tracks long, I think. Wow. Uh, yeah, so that's maybe. definitely a lot longer than your, your prior albums. That makes sense that this is going to be your debut. Yeah, it's like 55 minutes in runtime, I think. Okay. And... Uh, it was cut down from a lot. I mean, I think there I had at one stage it was like 22 tracks or something. Wow. And so it was a kind of pretty difficult process. It, it kind of came down to the mixing of the record when we were, I mixed the album in London with um, a guy, Danny T is his name. He's he mixed grain diesel and stuff. He's a um, really, really good mixer and producer. Mm -hmm. And just from like going through the tracks with him while we were doing the mixing process and stuff, it was kind of like, you would decide which ones were good enough and which ones you could cut out, which was sad because, you know, it's not that they were bad songs or anything, but it's kind of like you want to keep to a certain standard and you want to try and tell the story as concisely as possible. So, mm -hmm. um, yeah, it was a mad process. I've never worked on anything this long before, like an hour, close to an hour is like a, a long run time. So uh -huh. it was frustrating because when you would change the track listing, you know, if you put track two to track eight, I, I just have to listen to it for an hour to see if that works or not. You know, mm -hmm. uh, you got a dog in there. Sorry. My son just came flying through this door. I don't know. <laughs> and okay. then he brought the dog in with him. So I, I apologize for that. Um, I'm sorry. What kind of dog do you have? He's a Schnauzer Terrier mix. He's actually a coronavirus dog. If the, He didn't have coronavirus, but we got him in the beginning of the pandemic. <laughs> wow, jealous. That sounds like a nice mix. Yeah, well, it was funny. Um, it was, I mean, but 
So I've, I've adopted dogs in the past and it was like this whole process where they have to bring them to your house and they have to make sure that you're not like some scumbag that's going to like, you know, put the dog in some dog. But I don't know. There's like this whole process of how you have to, how you have to uh, adopt a dog this time around. It was like because of the virus, they the lady we adopted him was like she brought him out of the car. She's like, here. Yeah, no, here he is. And we kind of my sons played with him for a second. And then she's like. We're like, okay, like we we want him. She's like, really? We're like, yeah. She, so we just cut her a check and then she bailed. Like there's no like courting process or anything. It was like, you want him? Yeah. Okay, here you go. See you later. <laughs> oh man, jealous. I love a dog. I'm yeah. Best with dogs. Yeah, he he definitely brought a, a lot of, you know, positive energy to the, to the house over the course of this whole unfortunate time, but yeah, so sorry about that. That was a, quite the uh, <laughs> my son barging in here. But um, back to you in the record. It, you talk about it's telling a story. Is it a con? Is is it another concept album or no? Yeah, it definitely has a narrative. Anyway, there's a definite time and place, and you know, it's all kind of set in Dublin around New Year's Eve, and uh, yeah, a bit of a kind of like love triangle, I guess. So, um, yeah, the. The album definitely has kind of like a narrative. Um, so, yeah, you know, if you change one track in the track listing, you just got to listen to it for an hour to to figure out if that works and if that flows properly. Like, does the energy keep up the whole way through? Mm -hmm. That's the other thing. Like, once it's out, it's out. And uh, Yeah, there's no change in the tracks now, huh? Yeah, yeah. Because you can, like, mess it around and, like, jumble all the track lists and it's like, okay, is this the album? It's like, hmm, no. And you switch around again. Is this the album? Yeah, it's a funny process. Yeah, I can imagine like there in the in the middle of the record, it gets a little dicey, like trying to figure out like is this song six or is it going to be song seven? Like really, kind of. Do you have to listen to it through a bunch of times to figure out really how they're all going to lay down? Yeah, which is like you really got to have some good patience because <laughs> to change one song is an hour of your life gone. <laughs> Right, yeah, now you got to go re-listen to the whole record again. Yeah, but it's a nice process, though, even just trying to figure out where you're going to make the cuts on the actual vinyl, like what's going to be side A, what's going to be side B. I find, find that whole thing kind of real interesting, kind of just the artistry of that. So mm -hmm. yeah. That's amazing, and it's going to be on a vinyl. I love that. Yeah, double LP, so it's actually two vinyls. Wow, that's cool. Yeah. Did you put the other records out on vinyl or just the, is this going to be your first vinyl pressing? Uh, no, we've put everything I've uh, put it, everything that's on Spotify anyway is all um, on vinyl. Okay, that's cool. Yeah, we've got a, I've got a real sick fan base there. Um, yeah, they they just love the vinyl stuff, I guess, and they they buy it up and which I'm real appreciative. So uh, appreciative of appreciative appreciative of. <laughs> I appreciate it. You appreciate it. Um, yeah, no, well, yeah, because there's something to be said about having the the physical record. I mean, even if you're only gonna listen to it on Spotify, just having the physical that's the thing that is lost now with buying like singles off you know iTunes, which I don't even think is a thing anymore, but um or streaming the songs. It's like you don't have anything that you can really hold and connect to. I mean, who's to say I'm always worried that like one day the Spotify is just going to crash out and then like all the songs are going to be gone. And then it's like, well, how am I going to listen to music now? Oh, at least I have like, you know, crates upon crates upon crates of records I can put on. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. It's even like there's a couple of YouTube uh, channels that I subscribe to and they're usually like vinyl collectors who upload their old vinyls, you know, as MP3s and they're great for sampling and stuff. Oh, that's amazing. I've had it happen a good few times where their channels just get deleted, you know, because of copyright strikes. And oh, wow. Songs that are super rare songs. You can't really find them anywhere. And then they're just gone. You're like, whoa, this shit is <laughs> ephemeral, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Because that's the thing about like vinyl collection. If it's rare stuff and it's not going to be available anywhere, when you have it, you have it, you know, and you can hold it in your hands. It's like the music is on this. I know. Yeah a whole lot of other places no really... one's gonna take it away from me <laughs> yeah so that's i love the kind of vinyl even the design we had an irish artist um oscar tarns he designed all the visuals for the record and 
he just did a smashing job and the, the vinyl is, looks unbelievable. And I God, love it. The well, lyrics have- in it and stuff are so sick. So I can't wait to see it. Um, and I'm definitely gonna have to pick up the vinyl copy. Uh, mm-hmm. and get the deluxe one, if you get anything, I would recommend that. I'll get the deluxe one. I don't, yeah, I won't go. If, uh, I'm not gonna go cheap on you, dude. <laughs> <laughs> Looking one man, it's got the gay fold image with like the big, it's like me grabbing a pint. It looks like fucking the creation of man. It looks sick. Oh, that's so sick! I cannot wait to see it. And again, I'm gonna, I'm, I'm buying the that deluxe version. <laughs> <laughs> well, Kojak, dude, thank you so much for doing this. I really appreciate it. Sorry about my child coming bursting through this door. I apologize, my friend. Excuse <laughs> me for my rants. So. Oh, dude, that's what this is all about. It's all about you. Um, well, I can't wait to, to hear the record. It's coming out in two weeks. Town's dead. Um, and I have one more question before I let you go. I want to know if you have any advice for aspiring artists. Just do it yourself, man. And believe in yourself. Like there's, there's, um, you can go a long way with a bit of belief in some hard work, man. So that would be my advice. Bring me the best word.